Okay, so good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to the briefing session for the June uh, Council meeting. Um, as always, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. It's really important for us as a town to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and their ongoing contribution to our town and um, their connection to this country. Um, we, I just want to bring to everyone's attention that since we've had the new audio system installed, we now have the capacity to film the sessions. So tonight's meeting will be um, live streamed and available on the internet for the public to view. Um, so just keep that in mind during the conduct of the meeting. Um, moving on to item two on the agenda, so it's attendances and apologies. So okay, the CEO is an apology um, for this evening. Do we have any others? that have been received? Um, no, no, no. Has anyone heard from Councillor Gandula? No. 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 Okay. Um, so item three, we have some visitors with us this evening. So um, we have Katie Sullivan, um, Brett Hughes, and I'm not sure of Trevor's surname, I'm sorry. Bacanara. Sorry? Bacanara. Bacanara. Um, they're from the Department of Transport, from the Strategy and Reform team. Um, and they're going to be speaking to us tonight about the Your Move program, which um, the Department of Transport has offered the town of Bassendine to engage with. So um, would the three of you like to come up to the table? So we've allocated about 20 minutes for you to present. Um, I don't know if you wanted to use this one, if you can come up here. It's Graham, Graham suggested we present from over sure, there. Sure, that's fine. Um, yep. Because the mouse only has a certain, no problems. A certain um, range, so we'll do that. Um, while these guys will just get organised, you might just get ready for the mouse and so forth. Uh, firstly, thanks for taking uh, the time, you for letting us take your time uh, to share what we have available for you. Uh, so, I'm Brett, I'm the ED of Transport Strategy and Reform, which leaves me responsible for funny things like aviation regulation, heavy vehicle charging and the safety regime for autonomous vehicles, none of which I'll talk about tonight. <laughs> and a great program which is about helping communities do what they want to do in terms of their own uh, travel outcomes. Uh, Liam's our uh, manager of the program, unfortunately he's ill tonight. Uh, Katie's here, um, which um, Katie leads the team that would deliver the program, and Trevor uh, provides a lot of the background support for the program. Um, so your move, as you can see, is a travel behaviour change program. Um, it's been uh, offered to over half a million West Australians before. Some of you might have heard of the Travel Smart programs in the past. Uh, that had a focus on walking, cycling and public transport. We also had a Living Smart program with the Department of Health, which had a focus on sustainability and transport, and Active Smart with the Department of Sport and Recreation, which had a joint focus on physical activity. Um, so these programs are particularly successful in increasing the uptake of uh, new and existing public transport uh, and cycling infrastructure. Um, so you already know the town's vision um, and one of the things we're uh, keen about and happy about is the uh, alignment between the town's vision and the Your Move program because Your Move works with whole communities um, by engaging with residents and schools and workplaces um, to help people take part in the program. Uh, the program uh, lasts for a period which Katie uh, will describe to you or Trevor uh, but it has long-term benefits as well, at least five years legacy after that. Um, so it um, continues over time. So consistent with the town's vision, uh, your move supports sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, it um, uh, is consistent with the town of Bassendine's engagement with its community and engagement with the community, and it supports local connections as well. So I, I think it, when I start to think about this, it's really about helping the people, to the uh, community, to do what it wants to do and, and to be what it wants to be. Thanks, Katie. Uh, so we've run these programs in the past. Um, the reasons these programs are successful um, is because it's a partnership arrangement. We can't come in and run a program. We don't want to come in and tell people what to do. We want to engage uh, with the council, as we already have. Um, and engage with the, the community to help the community do and be what it wants to be. So previously we've partnered with Sport and Rec, 
and with uh, Coburn and Wanneroo. Um, and these uh, result in increased tr um, uh, active transport trips, walking and cycling, and physical activity, but also the public transport trips. So in these two programs, um, they engage with more than 10,000 households in each program uh, and with the schools and workplaces. Um, they also have partnerships depending on who we can get on board once we get up and running um, with the RAC or the Heart Foundation or HBF or Nature Play um, to provide synergistic programs or additional complementary uh, programs. Thanks Katie. So here's two, two slides, they're a bit small to read uh, possibly from there but I'll just pick a couple of highlights out uh, for you. So from, from uh, Coburn, 61% um, of the par participants created active transport plans as part of their coaching. Um, the program resulted in a 5% reduction in car trips per participant and a 6% reduction in car minutes travelled per, per participant. Um, now, that might sound a little bit, it can make a lot of difference uh, to some of the outcomes that you're trying to achieve, um, but it's still achieving what the, the residents want to achieve. We're not telling them to do less and stop doing things. We're helping them choose their own ways to do the things that they want to do differently. So in Wanneroo, 61% uh, of the participants achieve their active transport plan. 5% uh, of the, uh, sorry, uh, there was a 5% reduction in the car trips per participant and a 6% reduction in car minutes uh, travel per participant. Um, I'm going to pass over to Katie now because Katie knows all of the details of this and I just watch these guys and admire the work they do. Um, but I just want to reinforce how keen we are to in engage with the town of Bassendine and that's because um, I think there's a really strong alignment between the values that underpin um, the town of Bassendine and its community and the council and the values which underpin, underpin um, the Your Move program. Um, the, the town's um, values are both at the community and the council level. And you know, I'm an engineer, so I don't get excited easily. But, um, <laughs> I'm really excited with these sorts of programs. They're great to, to watch, they're great to run. It's great to see the collaborations that occur with the, um, the individual people and the council. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the team being able to run this program together with you. Uh, we've already had some good engagement uh, with the, the staff um, we've met with Bob and Renee and that's been great and uh, we're keen to work with you all, work with your community to develop and deliver a program that works for your community. Thanks, Katie. I think you've probably covered it now, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so just to quickly note here, um, Your Move is a behaviour change program distinct from a mass media marketing campaign. Um, we've got a cute little photo there of a great park facility that's been built through <laughs> trees still yeah. stuck in the middle of it. Um, so Doug Mackenzie Moore tells us that providing information alone has little impact on people's behaviour change processes. Um, so our programs have their um, roots in evidence-based research um, and in health promotion models and theory. So we use sophisticated behaviour change principles including the need for localised and relevant information, um, ongoing support and empowerment of your residents to make changes, and we look at their um, motivators and barriers as well. Um, and we work really hard to foster new social norms, so making physical activity and active transport a positive social norm in the community. So I've got a little visual here just to illustrate the breadth and depth of our program. So in the middle there you can see our targeted information coaching that residents receive and our contact with schools. Um, but it certainly has got um, a lot more breadth and depth to it. So it can include things if you guys are supportive in terms of soft um, uh, small scale infrastructure. We always connect with council in terms of promoting what community events are on offer and services in the town. Um, we've already spoken to PTA in terms of upgrades to local bus stops um, that will be funded potentially by PTA and a part of our Coburn and Watery projects has been um, installing wayfinding signs within those two localities. So we'll touch on those again in a sec. So what are the pro 
program objectives, you might ask. So our main objective is to increase um, public transport patronage with a focus on Bassendine train station. And obviously that will then spill over to increase patronage at neighbouring train stations as well. Um, we're keen to increase walking and cycling trips in the town. And obviously as a result of the first three, we'll see a decrease in the number of car trips that residents take. <coughs> Okay. So, um, some of the things we offer to local residents that we've offered in the past <coughs> in COVID and Wanneroo are, um, we, all, we always frame it as a town of Bassendine or a city of Coburn project because evidence has found that if we were to say we're coming from the state government, people switch off, whereas if it's a local, local um, government coming to them as a service, they're a lot more receptive. So that's one of the fundamental things we do. Um, it's backed by a detailed communications and stakeholder engagement strategy, and we'd like Tam Bassanese input in that. Um, depending on the re recommendations from our service delivery consultant, the following localised information and re rewards are likely to be offered to residents, such as active travel maps for the town of Bassanese, um, personally addressed letters and emails, such as a letter of invite from the Mayor, which is really quite fundamental to getting the word out there um, initially. Uh, Individualised journey plans, one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is one of our fundamental um, methodologies, uh, and we touch base with people several times during the program over a period of three to six months. Um, it might be three, four phone calls that, you know, they they ring them up and say, so we spoke about, um, last time you said you were going to walk to the local shops, how'd you go with that? Can we give you anything to help you with that? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a real communication and we always try and match the same coach with the same residents as well. Um, information about local relevant uh, events, such as partner organisations and the town of Bassendine, a welcome pack with backpacks, maps, brochures and other small rewards. And this is really quite fundamental as well um, to the su su success of the program. They're all um, little tools to help them um, you know, use public transport, walking and cycling in their local area. So uh, another fundamental thing that we always do is we try and um, uh, get a, a local Your Move officer embedded in the local council. Um, it's funded by DOT and it's a part-time position usually because um, the community engagement is vital to the program um, and working with the town's offices, schools and workplaces as a change agent for travel behaviour change. And having an officer on the ground throughout the whole project delivery is, is quite vital and essential because it maintains local authenticity and a key point of contact for participating schools and workplaces, and it supports other council officers to respond to day-to-day -day queries from residents. A Your Move officer is a vital conduit for information exchange between DOT and the town of Bassendine, and the officer will spend a bit of time in both offices um, and have hot, hot tests usually in, in both locations. Um, and that officer will manage uh, project management meetings at the town of Bassendine, and all project stakeholders while the program is being delivered. So, next. So our partnership. Um, the program really depends on a supportive partnership between council and DOT. Um, our partnership includes participation, integration, and the support of the town through the whole process of project planning, delivery, and evaluation. Um, and DOT invites the town to take part and actively participate in the the design workshops when we're designing the project. Um, this is, because this is your project as well as ours and that works best when the council is really engaged. Um, we rely on your intimate local knowledge to inform the design of all the elements of the program and deliver a better program to the local residents. So new local infrastructure. Um, this is a really important um, thing that we do alongside phone coaching. Um, it's important that local residents actually see changes on the ground as well. Um, so Your Move works closely with our cycling team at DOT to try and align our projects 
with any shared paths or bike boulevards, say that streets that are going through. We work to activate PSP upgrades, such as Whitfield Avenue, um, and we also install these wayfinding signs that you can see um, the, the ladies holding there, and uh, they can be scaled to suit the town of Essendon if the town would like to help um, implement that project. And it's been extremely successful in both Coburn and Wanneroo in engaging the local community. Um, the, the reaction we've got from local residents has been really um, heartwarming with kids you know, running along from sign to sign, um, identifying that, oh, this park down there I didn't know about. And we get a lot of comments from local residents about those. Um, and there's other local infrastructure like bike racks, bike repair stations, etc., etc., as well as, um, Katie mentioned, those bus information modules that the PTA have um, uh, committed to installing a whole bunch of them in the town of Bassanen if we deliver the program. So, Katie, over to you. Next slide. So this is a good one, the project value in terms of your move and what the town of Bassendine will receive. So our approximate budget is $600,000 for design, delivery and evaluation of the project. Um, that doesn't include the part-time funded position, which is approximately $50,000. And then obviously our team um, back at Transport who will be working to project manage your move in Bassendine. <coughs> I've just provided a really high level timeline here in terms of um, potential next steps if um, Council agrees to partner with the Department of Transport to deliver your move. So we'd act really swiftly to create an um, um, MOU with you guys or a letter of agreement um, as appropriate. And then we'd look to put in, con in place two contracts with service deliverers who would help us design, deliver and evaluate the program. Um, and we look to start engaging with residents um, in October. That's the date we've got in mind at the moment. But lots of contact with yourselves before then, and then um, as well recruit the Yormi officer as soon as possible to start working with council. Okay, so Town of Bass and Dean's role. Um, obviously, agreed to partner with us to deliver the program. Um, and consider providing some in-kind support for this officer. I know that you're super, super squished in terms of um, desks here at Council. Um, for our last program at Vic Park, um, this officer worked there probably a day a week and then was hot desking like Trev alluded to between um, Town of Vic Park and Department of Transport. So it would be in-kind support in terms of some kind of space, whether it be in a cupboard or what have you got available? Car park, maybe. Car park. <laughs> oh, the irony. Um, <laughs> and a computer, and obviously a team to sit in as well. Um, consider um, providing access to the ratepayers database, which is a standard practice for our program, because it helps create a more robust caller database. So we do that um, you know, as as required for filling the requirements of the Local Government Act um, and that enables us to <coughs> personalise those phone calls and that information that we send out in terms of letters. And also consider a contribution to fund um, local active transport grants or small scale infrastructure, things like the wayfinding in Bassendine to complement what's happening in terms of behaviour between the program program. That's pretty much everything I've got. <coughs> the bus module, I'm not quite sure I understand what that's about. Are you going to elaborate? Oh. Yeah, so you might have seen them, you know, typically you see the orange pole in the ground. That's the base model uh, information display that the BTA offer. And it doesn't, apart from a number, it doesn't give you a lot. So the bus modules are about six foot high, they're aluminium, and they've got timetables on both sides. You've probably seen them around Perth. Um, so every time we go into an area, we really push hard to get as many of those installed as possible, just to give people the mo most information. And is that a split cost between state and local government? Or how no, that's, that's um, PTO have agreed to fund that 100%. Trevor, you also mentioned um, upgrade to bus stops. Is that the bus module that's you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yep. 
but I have spoken to the guys at the BPA and um, I've sent through some information about various other uh, grant options that they have for um, upgrading the bus stops themselves. Yes, they, they removed a pile of our bus stops and then told us we could have them back if we paid for half the cost of replacing them. Oh, yep. okay. So if they'd be keen to help fund that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be a good time to ask. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think they identified 40 to 50 orange posts. Yeah, 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 they, 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 they possibly would be prepared to, yeah, between 45 and 50 that they'll replace with a bus module. Councillor Mikachin. Yeah, firstly, thank you for your presentation. Um, it was really engaging and it's, it's really exciting, so it's wonderful that we've got that opportunity. Um, I was wondering, in regards to the participants, how do you go about recruiting residents or selecting um, people to participate in the program? So, um, usually we send out a mayoral letter of invite, and that's also in coincidence with um, social media campaigns, um, local print media, if council's got a newsletter, and social media channels, we tap into those. Um, and so we kind of do um, an approach to schools as well. So we try and recruit local primary schools that are interested in the program. We also ask the town to champion in terms of workplace. Um, and once all of that has started to kind of infiltrate around the community, then we start those cold calls. And that call will be, um, hi, I'm, my name's Katie, I'm in from Norway Bassendine. You may have received a letter in the post. This is the program that we're running. Would you be interested in engaging with the program and explaining a little bit of background that, that you're not, not selling anything, it's just a free community engagement program. So, and then what happens is if they decide to opt in, um, they then receive, like Jeff said, three or four phone calls, they set goals, small targets, and they'll receive um, nudges, I guess text messages, whatever they decide they're comfortable to opt in with. So it might be text messages, emails, and the phone calls as well. So they might be getting it from a few angles. If they work locally, they might be getting it through work. If they have children going to primary school that's engaged, they'll be hearing about it there as well. And then they'll be receiving that personalised service as well. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's a nice, it's literally a coaching service. So, yeah. And you know, because they take great notes, the coaches will ring up and they'll, you know, they'll touch on the last conversation. So it feels like it's a familiar thing for you. It's not a telemarketing conversation. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. nothing like telemarketing, sorry. It's nothing like telemarketing. <laughs> yeah. It's nothing like mass media campaigns. No, it's really <laughs> It's more like way. a conversation that eventually is with somebody who's more like a trusted friend. Yeah. yeah. No, it sounds very personalised. And, mm. you know, it's great that you're touching on those elements. You know, one thing that's been at the forefront of a lot of things we're doing is, you know, how to achieve behavioural change. So it'll be really mm. fascinating to see um, how the model rolls out. Yeah. Yeah, and we're and keen we'll to have that. your input as well. Yeah. So it doesn't, so this is a program about behavioural change, is there ever, is there going to be any opportunity to increase uh, the bus services in the town eventually, if there is enough demand for it? Um, I'd better answer that. Um, I, I'm not, we're not, the Department of Transport isn't responsible for the PTA, I know. even though we're in the portfolio. Um, demand is an issue which drives bus services. I wouldn't like to kid you that this is going to increase the bus demand so much that you will get more services. Uh, but certainly you can use this program as information and leverage. Uh, I, I, again, I won't kid you that it will necessarily make a difference, um, but um, it, it's all information that you can use to, to help make your case. Hmm. So I, I don't know if the staff made you aware, but we're actually undertaking a transport study at the moment, ARUP is doing okay. a transport study for us. Who's doing it? ARUP. Oh, yeah. uh, which I think would is very timely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, we'd love to talk to them. Yep. Perfectly for this. We've, yeah. we've already given a lot of feedback uh, into that study. Um, and, and particularly what we call the island is, is cut off by the river and Guildford Road and Tonkin mm -hmm. Highway. Yep, yep. And there's only one bus service and it comes once an hour. And I can guarantee you that the amount of people within that little pocket would would use the train station a ton more if there were more regular bus services mm. just within that little mm. island. Mm. So I personally live two kilometres away within that island from the train station. Mm. I drive to the. I'm a, I'm a regular user of the train. Yep. I use it every day. Yep. 
um, but I don't have time in the morning to walk to the train station. So um, if there was a bus at that early morning, I guarantee you that little pocket, you, you have a captured market of behavioural change for the people Absolutely. just within that island mm. to get them to use the train in the morning, I guarantee you it would work. Yep. But it's not going to happen if they don't have a bus. So um, the, the feedback that you'll get, and I'm sure, and there's, there's a lot of information that's been provided into that transport study, which will give you more of an understanding about the people of Bassentine and what we um, want and need in terms of our transport infrastructure. Um, so I'm feeling like this is a bit of cut before the horse. Um, in, in that we would need to give you the transport study in order for you to understand our community in order for us to roll it out effectively, otherwise it's going to be ineffectual. Um, so is it a kind of a program that you come and I, I saw a timeline six months or something? Mm, yeah, um, between three to six months. And I guess part of that, that, so that's actually delivering on the ground before that up until October, part of the um, consultant who will be designing and delivering the program for us in terms of the actual coaching calls and helping design some of the materials. There's a formative research section in the scope and RFT um, so where they actually have to come and consult with the community. So if you've got that information available, obviously that would be incredibly valuable as well. Well, when's the study finished, Tony? <coughs> um, I think it's scheduled about either August or early September. Okay. Well, oh, that might work. Yeah. And they would have a whole heap of that information already. Already. If they're allowed to share it with us, we would value that. Um, I think the opposite is true as well. As I said, I'm an engineer and we love to build things. Um, but we do have to, in our transport plans, maximise the, um, the, the benefits of the potential patronage and not just um, build things and hope that people will come and use uh, the infrastructure. Um, but the, um, the behaviour programs maximise the use of existing infrastructure and using the transport plan to help inform us to do that um, gives a better result for the community. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> and I think I think you're pitching to a market that's not me, which is why I kind of have a bit of a problem with it because I'm I already use public transport. I already walk everywhere. Sure. I see my barrier yep. barriers and they are X, Y and Z. Yeah, so you're not pitching it to me, you're pitching it to people that already aren't doing it. I get it. Um, but what about the people that are already doing it? Yeah, um, look, we, we don't intend to change everybody's behaviour. You know, there's a lot of people doing the, the right thing, the good thing, if you like. I don't want to be judgmental to say that one thing is good or bad. Um, but a lot of people find that they can change a few of their, trip, their trips and decide that, actually, I do want to do a bit more exercise. Hang on a minute. I, and without pitching to you personally, I don't have to take the car to the uh, train station every day. One day a week, I'll take the bike. And that'll help me do these other things that I want to do. Um, so there's all sorts of little changes that occur, rather than expecting everybody to uh, ditch the car and walk to the train station. That, that isn't the way it works. It's all about the margins for all sorts of different activities for all sorts of different people in different ways. Um, so it's, again, it's not like the mass media campaign that says we're going to change everybody's behaviour and they're all going to wear seatbelts um, by telling people, which doesn't work. But it's all about these individual little mar margins in different ways. Okay, thanks. And one last question. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, I'll take up everyone's time. Um, it does say in here that there's an expectation for us to a little bit of money into the program. Is there an indication of what that might be? Yep. So um, previous programs um, have ranged. So Big Park contributed twenty thousand um, dollars. City of Coburg contributed one hundred and fifty. Wanneroo one hundred and fifty. I think around one hundred and fifty. Um, so provided um, offices with a kind of, I guess, a wish list of items that would complement the program. Um, so that would be, I can provide that to you guys or through direct. So, so Katie, you just. You so, so just to clarify, when I met with you with yep. um, some of the staff, we yep. had this discussion as well around what the expectation would be for the town's contribution from a financial perspective. Yep. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that the basic program we could 
choose to partner with without there necessarily being a financial um, contribution. Yeah. Any contribution was up to us. And then, for example, you used the $20,000. Yeah. Um, my understanding was that that could be for things like bike cracks that absolutely. we were yeah. potentially going to be putting in already and that kind of thing. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I assume that your programs are multifaceted in that obviously you've got buses, trains and cycling as probably your main three yeah. with whatever else is accelerating. So when you're pitching to people, I'm assuming in the beginning it's trying to ascertain a direction with mm. the people that you're contacting on the phone yeah. and then trying to measure how much of an uptake they, they engage. Okay. Yeah. And I think when we spoke as well, when you talked about the schools a bit more than you did tonight, and yep. for example, putting some yeah. assisting the schools to put in place programs such as walking buses and those kind of initiatives. Absolutely, bike education yeah. sessions, um, a whole raft of things. So we didn't have much time to so no, no, go no. into great detail about that. But yeah, our schools program is supported by um, a great website as well. So schools engage with that, and we support them through a bit of a journey in terms of activating their whole school communities. So getting champions as far as teachers, parents and student leaders to help with the program and, and gather that momentum. So having walk to school Wednesdays or peer free Fridays and just having that constant repetitive behaviour change messages that is actually healthier and you feel better and you feel, you know, parents get to spend that quality time and you'll get to know people in your neighbourhood and all of those kind of nice community connections that the program fosters. We do that through our schools program. Are there any other questions here? Um, given the size of the council, uh, we're tw 10 square kilometres, I, I don't suppose that matters, but how many people do you think you would be sort of a, a communicating with you, talking 30%, 20%, 10%? So we will invite everybody, every resident to join oh, wow. the program. Um, and we've set a couple of recruitment goals in terms of our scope and RFT documents. Um, so we'll, I guess we're waiting to hear back with what those consultants will come back with. But, um, a minimum, um, I guess the first, the first recruitment goal that we've set is 2,000 adults, and the second one is double that, 4,000. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Brown. Uh, <coughs> terrific program, thank you. Uh, focusing on walking, cycling and public transport. It's also, I mean, walking and cycling, there are impediments to that for people who are less able. <coughs> people with medical conditions, people that aren't quite ready for the go for yet. And where do you see electric push bikes, cycles, fitting with it? I'm talking about the big hybrid things with pedals in them. The reason I ask is this, in European cities, big European cities are encouraging small, foldable electric push bikes, yep. through modern technology. These things fold up to the size of a single child pram, so people can go from their home to work. If the weather changes, they can get back on, on a train and come home, or they indeed can go from their home to public transport, fold them up and take them with them. Yeah. I actually, as a consequence of looking at your program, I rang the department, contacted the Department of Transport, and they said they're illegal. <coughs> because they don't have pedals on them. Fold up bikes? Fold up electric bikes. Um, <coughs> bikes are illegal because they So I asked why. And I got a response, written response. I asked why they're illegal. And they said because if the battery runs out, you'll need to pedal home. It seemed a funny response to legislation. I've got the email. Yeah. It says that's the reason they're illegal. I realise there's power restrictions and whatever. They've got to be under five watts or whatever. But they form a very important part to that group of people that can't walk to the railway station, or they don't have a shower in the city yeah. when it's 40 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. There are impediments to walking and cycling. So I was wondering if there's an opportunity to discuss that with your people. The introduction, not the introduction so much, but looking at legislation surrounding small, fold up electric push bikes. There's one called Stego. Is T E G O. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one to have a look at. Mm -hmm. And it really does fill that niche. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if in your thinking there's an opportunity to do that for that 
thin wedge of people that can't walk or cycle. You might be able to answer that, right? I can yeah. Talk yeah, I'll have, I'll have a shot. Um, the first thing is that um, electric vehicles are starting to change that part of the transport market. Um, and there are indications that it's going to change it quite dramatically. Um, so we don't know how much and we don't know when because the electric bike prices are uh, still quite high um, compared to a, a pedal cycle. Um, I'm, I'm not involved in bicycle policy directly, so I see bits of it. I see the bit of the road safety thing that says they've got to be power limited to 250 watts or whatever it is. Um, we're, we're always happy, the Department of Transport is always happy to have the conversations with people. Uh, we're not in a position as part of the program to change policy or uh, promote incentives or whatever. We may be, and I'm just thinking laterally here, um, sometimes we can be in a position to, um, to engage differently, like with the bicycle suppliers, um, to see whether they would be uh, willing, and I'm completely dreaming here, uh, willing to partner with the program to, to be able to uh, offer bicycles, not as a subsidy, maybe at a discount, maybe whatever that, that is, so that there's more understanding about what the options are for some people that don't have it at the moment. Uh, the government's uh, financial position, I've got to say, is um, uh, limits things like what it wants to do in terms of subsidies and discounts, uh, so those sorts of financial incentives uh, tend to, they tend to be reluctant about. Uh, we're always happy to have the conversation and take it up with our bicycle policy people and engage with them on the infrastructure and potentially we'll, we'll have the question around the design to see whether there's anything that we can do together. Mm. Sure, there's, happy also, to do that. there's also um, in our Wannery project, RAC had quite a big role and did a couple of electric bike trials. So um, partnering with um, larger workplaces and offering it to employees to trial a bike for a period of, I think, 12 weeks, 10, 12 weeks. <coughs> and they had to keep a travel diary and they had to pledge that they would use those electric bikes to do those trips for their work commute for a sustained period of time, so getting the behaviour change to set in. And at the end of the program, they had the opportunity to purchase those ski bikes because they are quite expensive for half the retail price that they were purchased. They were really nice e-bikes. And the results for both Perth Metro and Albany were quite incredible in terms of behaviour change and you know, all of those great outcomes for that mm. trial. So it's a fantastic technology out there. This, yeah. like I said, I, I just looked at one, mm. and like, so they're using them, they're encouraging the use of them in cities, yeah. uh, and yet doing away with pedals, which is superfluous. And they couldn't give a real good reason why this, apart from the fact that well, when you between here and June, love you run out of power. Yeah, yeah, that's tricky. These things have got a range of over forty-five kilometres. This yeah. is just some yeah. basic research. And, and countries like Holland and France, in the bigger cities, they're being encouraged. They're small, no bigger than this chair, can fold up to the size of a single child's pram. So can I just ask, if um, Council chooses to partner with the program, it sounds like there's a lot of people who are keen, yeah. um, I'm assuming there'll be more opportunities to discuss the details Absolutely. at some stage. So yeah. um, does anyone have any question, further questions that would influence whether or not they're going to support this? Because we'll have more opportunities to discuss the specifics later on. Any of the staff have any questions? One last question maybe. If councillors uh, came up with a program which encouraged the use of bikes in some way, perhaps applying for a grant, would you guys, if it was something appealing, would you actually also incorporate that into your promotions or not? Mm. Uh, We'd have to look at it, I guess, but yeah, sure. On a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. <laughs> So, so if, if there's the opportunity by which there can be allied activities mm -hmm. that supports council and our objectives in the program, that's what we should be looking at. And that's why, why we want a, a collaborative dialogue to see what might be possible. <coughs> um, whether they're events or local businesses or grants or whatever those things are, that should be part of the design process that we're keen to talk to you about. In both Coburn and Wanneroo, we set up a partnership group with local businesses and various stakeholders like the RAC, HPF, um, and staff from the, the city. And we had regular monthly meetings trying to do these exact things. I'm specifically thinking of a program that started in Europe where they have the double bikes and it's for the elderly taking them to and from the shops because yep. no, quite often the elderly have to catch taxis program. back. 
and that's a program that I've been quite interested in for a while. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. Happy to look at all, all yep. options. Well, thank you. I think um, that was a great presentation and um, really appreciate you giving the Town of Bassendine the opportunity to partner in this program. And so thanks to Katie and Trevor and Brett for your time this evening. I'm sure we'll be in touch in the near so, future. Thanks for having us. If you've got any other questions that come to mind afterwards, you know what it's like. Get on the phone, talk to us, um, and we're happy to continue to work with you. Thank great. you so much. Thank you. Okay, so item four, declarations of interest. None. Okay, item five, addresses by members of the public. Mr K, you're the only person here. Is there anything that you would like to address us on? Uh, yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was thinking it would be possibly more a question, so that's how my thinking goes. But um, the indicative, the revised um, program for the strategic planning framework. I'm very <coughs> concerned that the program seems to be stretching well beyond the May 2019 date that we originally targeted. Um, Mr Dowling is new but he would probably be aware that most of us wanted the rezonings and things somewhere back in 2006. Um, the 2008 study by Haim Sharley was well regarded by the community as to doing things and here we are now looking at a plan may be appearing about 2020. Um, I think people forget that what the plan actually does in real things in, a, in changing land use planning is that it affects a lot of residents who may have thought for some years that their land was going to be rezoned and thus perhaps attract a higher value for them if they wanted to sell their asset to move on or whatever. I walk around the streets, a lot of our residents are old and you can see some that you used to see that now you don't see. Um, so I'm very concerned that are we going to be here in another 50 years time still waiting to get the plan finalised and that, that bothers me a great deal. It bothers me a little bit that in the, the program that um, I assume Mr Dowling has prepared there's a couple of items that are running concurrently uh, which are Sorry, I'll see if I can find my bit with my marks on it that I can talk to you about. Um, and I guess... Um, I guess having been in the industry and knowing the work involved in some of these plans, I'm very nervous that the, the proposed time frames are quite tight and that some things really need to be done in a sequential manner. So that uh, in the proposed revised planning under local planning strategy in item two um, is phase two, develop local integrated transport plan, uh, item 2.3.2 .2, and in the next item there's development of residential density scenarios at 2.21 and there is also further down in item 3.2 prepare and develop a contribution plan. Both the transport plan and the contribution plan have to follow what densities are selected. A lot of work can be done to be prepared for it but without knowing where we think we'll put higher density, in other words higher demand on services, then both transport and, and service planning really can't proceed. So while I admire Mr Dowling's intention to run these parallel, and maybe they can be, but my experience is that without establishing what densities we want to do, even if we change it later, it doesn't matter, but it, we need to establish something so these plans can be done. Um, the development contribution plan people talk about quite lightly, it is a very big piece of technical work. What it needs to do is identify all the existing services, identify what will be required after the plan is implemented, even though it might take 20 years, work out what it's cost so that individual con contributions can be made in a meaningful way. It also needs to be set up so that it can be continuously upgraded over the years because costs change, some things get a bit cheaper, some things get dearer. So it needs to be very carefully structured and set up. 
and uh, the only person I've ever seen do it was it was an officer at the city of Canning and he managed six town planning schemes and his development contributions were all highly detailed and listed he had them all updated every six months you could get an updated one to know where you were on your development and it's probably the most brilliant piece I've ever seen done in local government we need to be there but I know how much work it takes so for me in this program I don't think this program well I'd like to think it could be I don't think that it can actually practically be achieved because some things need to be done followed by others and, and at the back of all this and I've always said this from when we started back in 2016 it's the community consultation uh, I think it's terrific council gets involved considers it all puts the best plan forward but I do know my fellow citizens will stand up and pick it to bits which will cause further delay I mean let's that's what will happen so um, and the, the plan put up needs to be well defended to my fellow citizens the public so I'm, I'm quite concerned at the delays and that it's going on and I'd like to urge council as I have urged mr. Dowling and mr. Reed to do whatever can be done to keep us on target and going ahead and wherever possible to pull things back uh, also knowing that community consultation will be a very big task Thank you. And I'm sure when we get to that item, there'll be questions that councillors have for the staff. I appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce, I can't believe you said we'll still be here in 50 years waiting. <laughs> you and I won't be. Let's hope. Well, <laughs> some of these. Councillor Brown. Let <laughs> uh, can I say we've been trying to close scheme 10, 4A for 15 years? We just used the word weak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm weak because I'm what community. Mean, We're all community. <laughs> We're all trying to do it. I mean, we no understand. Joking. No, no, it's all right. <laughs> Have a look in um, Mrs. Carter's history of Bassendine. There's a picture of the top end of Old Perth Road in 1927. Go and have a look at it now. Thanks, <laughs> man. Okay, so um, moving on to sure. item six, which is the report. <coughs> so, councillors, just before we start <coughs> discussing the reports, I just want to remind everyone that we're in a briefing session, so it's the opportunity for us to ask questions. Um, so, we need to try and refrain from expressing opinions or debating during this part of the meeting. Okay, so item 6.1, this is the Lord Street and Chapman Street properties um, for sale. Are there questions for the staff on this item? Uh, uh, so I just want to make sure my knowledge is complete about these blocks. Were these the two blocks that were required at 5% of the value from the state government? Correct. What was the specific purpose or sale condition that was attached to those books? Uh, my understanding is that the condition was that the funds would be used in its entirety for the playground at Sandy Beach. I've got a follow-on question from that. So there's been some discussion in the community obviously about this playground and about the funding um, and about some of the other things that we may need to potentially look at such as toilets at that site. Um, I had previously spoken to the CEO to investigate whether or not there was an opportunity to use some of that money for things such as toilets or alternatively if there was, um, if council did want to pursue a smaller scale at that site whether any additional money could be distributed elsewhere. Do you know if that's been, we've had any advice on that yet? Um, I, not at this stage, my understanding is with the toilets that uh, we can actually use cash and loo money for but that mm -hmm. might be another matter but I'll find out. Um, I've also got a question around the timing for the sale. So the report indicates that it's a pretty low market at the moment for real estate. And um, have we received any advice around um, whether <coughs> now is a good time to sell or? Um, with the comments that uh, Bruno uh, made, I think he was more concerned that we would try to sell them through uh, what they call a tender process, where he, he couldn't have, um, advise the people the price and that sort of thing. Um, he maintains that either by auction or by private treaty, uh, we would have a better chance of selling the blocks. Yeah. So just to clarify, in on page four, he, he refers to the time of the sale and he's mentioning potential, his recommendation at this point yeah. is to put the blocks on the market in late September or early October, so not right now. No, that's right. So, would it be correct to think that if it got to September and still the market wasn't looking great, then we might consider to delay it? Absolutely. Okay. 
Councillor Hamilton? Um, I think reading the report that the real estate agent suggesting that September, October is best because we're coming into summer, I'd be a bit concerned. I'd probably maybe go back to the real estate agent and talk about delaying it because Christmas time usually is very bad as well. So, I, I think it was sorry. I think he was more mentioning uh, the spring sort of time when <coughs> yep. when things start selling. That that's his comment to us, whether it's true or not. So I'm unsure when the mayor was mentioning about perhaps could some of the funds be included and utilised for the upgrade of the toilets. Is that an unknown at the moment, or? Um, yes, yes, that is an unknown at this time. Okay. So yeah, attempts have been made to get uh, support tonight, but um, unsuccessful. Okay. I'll well, have a response by council. Councillor Quinton. The five percent is that that's paid once the blocks are sold. No, we, we purchased the blocks in the financial year 2016-17. Okay, so that's what the 5 percent's already been. <coughs> yeah, we okay. paid uh, 50000 for both blocks. Great. Okay. And, it, and it's just a normal... It's just like buying a house, right? So someone puts an offer on, we yep. don't have to accept it. Mm -hmm. The blocks can stay yep. for sale as long as we want to have them for until Correct. the market picks up. Yep. So I'm not really understand. I get, I get. He's he's an expert and he's a real estate agent and he does this all the time. But uh, what difference would it make if we put them on sale now? Uh, and if we if we got ten offers now, uh, and we got the right price, why wouldn't we just take it now? I don't understand why we would need to delay it at all. Oh, I guess he was give us some advice, we're not yeah. real estate agents, but there's no reason why we couldn't put it out on the market now. If that's what council desires, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Councillor Brown? In, in the unlikely event that doesn't go ahead, um, public opinion or whatever, too costly, um, would those blocks revert back to the state? Or would they, they're, they're would they be diverted to another purpose? like? Some of the other priorities in the town? Yeah, we, we purchased the uh, properties um, uh, on the sole expectation, or um, it was actually stated in the in the agreement that they would be used um, to sell and use the funds to um, provide the playground at Sandy Beach Reserve. Um, so, uh, in terms of what else could be funded, um, uh, could it be toilets, could it be um, acquiring the, um, the sewer and the deep? So, um, then that's the sort of stuff that we, that we have yet to get a response to. Um, I'm sure that we can find um, yeah. some projects down the same first town. Just simply, if it was scaled back, you know, only the cost was similar to the sale purchase price of one property, then we're left with a surplus property. I'm, let's chuck a couple of orders in there, but there's there's some issues around the main, main seat modification. So that, that's the question that the staff are seeking to get yeah, clarification no, 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 on for the meet, no. for the council meeting. In the worst case, we don't give the blocks back. Um, Councillor Hamilton? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I always thought, for instance, reserve funds, we have a project that, uh, that didn't go ahead, there's 87,000 left in that fund, which the project is not going ahead. So. I understand that simply a matter of writing to the minister to get those funds reallocated to another purpose that's usually for another reserve. Would that be correct? Um, the cash and loo funds? This is a, um, the one I'm talking about is the Broadway one, but I'm yep. get, what I'm getting at is I've been told by one of the staff, one of the uh, managers, that it can be, it's as simple as writing to the minister to have that change but usually the requirement is that it has to be expenditure on a, a, a reserve is that correct so the cash in lieu funds the uh, minister has already approved um, for um, for the playground at sandy birch right um three hundred and fifteen thousand or something don't don't quote me on that number but it's it's a substantial number um yeah, that has been approved uh, by the minister for the playground as part of the um the, the capital acquisition Process. Um, okay. so, so the three form, or the three parts, um, was um, the sale of the land, 
and um, the proceeds from the land, um, Lottery West contribution and the cash in lieu contribution. So the playground um, will be being uh, constructed, proceed, if we proceed, uh, will be being constructed without uh, any municipal funds, without any rate funds um, being um, utilised for the process. Okay. Mr. Hackett, can I just ask, obviously this is a slightly different topic, but do you have an idea about when the playground will come back to council? Um, Following the resolution at last month's meeting? Yeah, I look, I'm hopeful for the July and July around. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, so moving on to 6.2. This is the verge tree that was damaged on Clark Way. I have a question around the streetscape contribution, the $2,221, and where that comes from. Yes, uh, through the chair. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, the castle sets the fees and charges mm -hmm. and it's been determined on the purchase price of a tree and then the ongoing maintenance of that tree until it's established uh, after three years. Okay, so that was my next question. So this fee is set so that we're not having any expense um, yes. to replace it and to maintain it? Yes. Okay. And sorry, second question. Obviously in this situation, part of the problem is that there was non-compliance with the demolition permit. That's correct. Yeah. So, is there any consequence? What is there follow up? What happens in that situation? Um, I did. I did speak to the um, the principal buildings about today, and as you've indicated, you know, there, there was a condition placed on the on the developer to to, to submit an application to protect the tree, mm -hmm. and that was uh, was not undertaken. Uh, um, so, um, I did actually ask that question in regards to uh, whether there's a consequence. Um, so, I can probably get that. To you. That's okay, I can speak to you during the week. Okay. Are there further questions? Councillor uh, Quinton? So, so the landowner has offered to replace the tree themselves. If we wanted to go down that track, um, obviously they want to save the demolition company two and a half grand. What, what would be the process if we decided to go down that track and allow them to, to replace the tree? Um, very similar to what's already outlined here. So the, the recommend, officer's recommendation is that we pursue the, the demolition contractor because they were the, they, they've admitted some um, liability in regards to the, the damage to the tree. So if you wanted to pursue the, uh, the, the, prop, the property owner, it would be a similar process except that you've already had an admission from the, from the demolition contractor. Uh, my understanding is that the demolition contractor offered to replace the tree. Yes, so that's correct. So, so we are pursuing that process. So we can't just return the the um, um, the, the um, deposit, the security de bond, because that's for it, the administrative processes that we is that they that we would uh, retain the security bond until they've paid that fee for the damage to the tree. That's the process. Okay. Any further questions? Oh, excuse me, no, no, I'm confused. Um, we retain the bond until they replace the tree? We can get there. Until, they, the provide question. The, until they provide the funds for the replacement of the tree. But um, the, the question was that they, they agreed to re replace the tree themselves. That was the question. Oh, okay, sorry, my, my apology. Um, well, they may. Look, in our experience, the uh, people may say that they're going to they, they replace the tree, and they may well do so, but then the ongoing maintenance of that tree for three years until it's established it may not occur, and then the tree may die, and that means the council then needs to come back in again and then replant that tree, and so there's an ongoing process. So um, obviously this, this person has admitted you know, to, to damaging the tree. Council has, a, has in place uh, uh, a certain you know, policies and there's, there's a local law in regards to the protection of trees and if there's any damage to that tree and so there's an opportunity here to recoup those funds because the tree does have a value that, that um, is, is, is also important, not just the replacement of it but the value of that tree to the environment. So you're, in your experience, the answer is, in your experience, <coughs> people promise to do these things and they don't? Well, no, look, I'm just saying that it may not necessarily be followed through, they might have all the things. Do we, do we have their money? We've Sorry. got the bond. Do we have the money? We have a security bond from the property owner, but not from the 
but not from the demolition uh, uh, demolition contract. We're in a pretty strong position to get them to replace the trees. Yes, we are. We are fortunate in this specific case. We are in a stronger position to to argue the case. In previous cases, which have been articulated in the report, with the where trees have been vandalised, we've never been able to identify who may have actually vandalised or damaged the tree, whereas in this case we we have been able to identify that person. Thanks, Tom. Okay, moving on to 6.3, the workforce plan. Um, I had a discussion with Mr Costrella earlier this evening about the fact that some of the positions on the workforce plan um, that we're discussing, it might be better for us to do this as a confidential item at the end of the agenda. Is there anybody who has a problem with that? No? Okay. So we'll come back to that later on. Um, 6.4, the electronic recording and streaming policy. I just had a comment to make that when it came to Council last time and we deferred it, that there were a number of changes that I had flagged. Mike, you're looking horrified. That I'd flagged as needing to be made. No, minor, minor things. So um, during the week maybe I could... Sure. I think this was... Yeah, there were a couple of things yeah. in there that I thought were a bit obsolete. So if we're doing a new policy, we may as well tidy it up. Yes, right. Are there any questions? How come the camera had to go there? <laughs> um, it has been moved next week. I asked the CEO last week. Yeah, and it's been moved. We haven't had time to yeah. put it over there. Where is it being moved to? Uh, <laughs> straight over there. Yeah. You get your good side. Your good side, he said. <laughs> yeah. but the will gets on it. No, it won't. No. no. Might have to shift on. Here we go. Okay. Everyone happy? Mm. Do, I think does staff understand that in a public meeting that people attend, people can see them yes. in, in the room? Yes. Okay. All right. That wasn't clear to me. But I thought the angle was only for the council. Well, the current angle isn't really ideal because it's it catches this chair here. Yeah, so I think it would be better for everybody if it was so it'll central go this way, yeah. which means it won't catch the public anyway. No, well, the idea no. is for it to be councillors and staff who are captured. Yeah, we may, we may need to upgrade the camera just and say a couple hundred dollars or something so we can get the right angle. So, we're going to get a hairdresser every time we have a meeting to yeah. come. Sorry. <laughs> Important questions, okay. Apologies. <laughs> okay, 6.5, uh, the waiver of fees for the Bassendine for free meeting. I just have a policy question. So so in 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 kind um, contributions, is that always going to come to council for a decision? Yes. Thank you. That was all. Nothing further? Sorry, if I just, just add to that. Um, there is no delegated authority to uh, to the administration to um, negotiate fees. The fees are the fees. Okay. Can I just clarify, um, is the suggestion that it being kind because it has already been paid for? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, it, it uh, has not been paid as I understand, uh -huh. um, but an invoice would be raised pending the outcome of the determination by Council. Okay. So if Council was to waive the fees, yes. um, then obviously we wouldn't be raising an invoice. Um, or the alternative, and I think this is what um, Salvatore is recommending, yeah. is that um, his business unit not be um, disenfranchised by that amount and have it as a donation, and donation by the town to the town so that the organisation doesn't have to pay. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, everybody happy? Yeah. Move on to 6.5, Strategic Planning Framework. Mr Downing, I was just wondering, um, uh, Mr Kay raised a couple of points around the time frame and sequence um, and the concurrency of some of the projects. Are you able to offer some comments on that for Council? Yeah, yeah happy to do so. Um, okay. Um, yeah, the time frame has been rejigged because there is, um, well, Council recently resolved that um, and through, and it, was, it came through the design Bassendine that. Um, if we were to present some uh, density scenarios or a range of densities, uh, there would need to be an understanding in the community of what the form and scale and nature of that density might look like. Um, so through the Design Bassendine um, <coughs> Advisory Group, they've decided that this becomes a priority work at the moment, but it's dovetailed with the current development I'm doing of the different residential density scenarios. And we hope to bring those two together 
uh, out for community comment, probably uh, targeting September uh, of this year. So there'll be an opportunity for people to have a look at that and provide feedback to us. And the intent is to go out into the community and try and explain those and, and solicit or elicit um, feedback as possible, as much as possible. Um, the viewer is still hoping that uh, once we've done all that and by then the transport study will be completed because the transport study is one of the informing studies that need to help guide the local planning strategy. It's a key component of it. Um, so that'll be completed and we've already done the built form uh, character study which is leading into the uh, development of these design guidelines. So with all that in place, we're still aiming to have a draft of the revised planning strategy by the first quarter of next year and then that'll again go out through for formal public comment and then it has to and if it's all accepted or there's modifications and they're addressed to it then follows through the uh, statutory planning process itself which might take a, a little bit time from on there. Um, in terms of the local planning scheme we've already done a what's called a basic amendment which has brought the scheme format uh, up to date and it's also corrected some anomalies so the major thing to do now with the scheme is probably to uh, look at any changes of land use and uh, zones and the density codings which will come out from the local planning strategy when that's completed and that'll and I envisage that any changes to the planning scheme will be a major amendment to that scheme rather than a wholesale review so that will hopefully shorten that process somewhat and then once we've got that out of the way, we can then um, start to dovetail or, or detail into um, the development of activity centre plans and um, what's called urban corridor plans, which are all set out in the Perth Peel 3.5 million planning framework. And that requires a lot more sort of detailed planning and design. So that will follow the strategy and the, and the scheme amendments. So, that's hopefully a bit of an explanation of where the process is going and how long it's likely to take, but I'm happy to explain further to Bruce in writing if that's what he yep. would require or request. Yeah, no, that's fine, Tony. I'm happy yep. to keep talking. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a number of other questions of my own, actually. Um, so you referred to the major complex amendment of the scheme. Um, is that going to allow us to achieve the things, like for example, we've talked about having design guidelines that are enforceable. Are we going to be able to incorporate that into a scheme amendment or does that require a whole new scheme? I know and that can be done as part of a scheme amendment. If you want certain provisions written into a planning scheme that guides the form of development, well there's two ways you can do it. One is you have local planning policies which become part of the planning scheme or to give them a bit more statutory force if you like you can actually write them in as provisions in the in the scheme and, that, and you can do that through a scheme amendment so that can actually form part of that amendment. Thank you yeah that answers my question. Um, would there be an intention to do a, a new scheme at some stage down the track in addition to this? Uh, well, if we get this major amendment and it meets all the commission requirements, then I don't envisage that we would need to do a major new scheme. Uh, local governments are required to review their scheme every four years, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do a new one. You just have to sort of give a report on what's happened to date and then make a determination as to whether a new scheme is required or you can substantially alter the current scheme. Sorry for asking questions that might be a bit silly, but That's right. <laughs> um, it sounds like we would be making quite significant changes to our current scheme in terms of density, some land use, yep. having some of these uh, provisions written in. What's the difference between doing a major amendment and doing a whole new scheme? Like You indicated the time frame is shorter, but otherwise what... Yeah, uh, if you did a whole new scheme, it would probably take at least two years, possibly longer. Uh, some schemes are required to go through an environmental approval process which can add more time to it but by doing a scheme amendment um, the process can be shorter because you're only concentrating on some, not a whole range of matters rather you, you focus on several matters um, and because we're a fairly urbanised community um, I'm anticipating that won't be a problem by doing it through a scheme amendment. If you're more like say, perhaps say the city of Swan where you've got urban and rural areas that's fairly comprehensive. Uh, you may need to do a wholesale scheme. Um, that's probably the only sort of difference I can explain at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Quinton. What, are, what has been the thinking around how we are going to explain and tell the story about this to our community in layman's speak? Has there been much thinking about that yet? 
uh, well, we've talked about the ways and means we could go out and ex try and explain it to the community. Um, but you know, you're right about putting in layman speak. Um, I certainly think, think that's a consideration that we need to do um, because you know people like myself can talk in planning jargon and people don't understand it. Um, so we obviously may need to look at trying to get assistance to help write that or present information and explanatory material to explain that. Um, it has probably been done elsewhere. Um, and the Mayor did mention the Future Bayswater Group to me, which I am aware of them. And uh, that person was a person who resides in Bayswater who simply off his own back has got up and put all this together and written explanations to the community. So, and he actually won a National Planning Champion Award for that as well. So um, there's a model out there for us to follow. But yes, it, um, look, I'm open to suggestions and ideas as how we may wish to do that. Okay, um, yes, I, I think that it, um, picking up on Mr K's point, um, it's all very well to put a plan out to a community, but if the community doesn't understand what you're putting to them, yeah. then it just creates uh, lag time and confusion. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering, is, is, it, is it that we're going to have to need to put some money around some kind of communication strategy to ensure that the community gets this, uh, given that we do have such a short time frame to explain it to them? Well, it depends how you're going to carry all that out, because if you want to have like forums and you want people to facilitate forums, then you, I would suggest you get a professional facilitator in. Alternatively, you know, you can have one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings or briefings where my, I go out and, and make myself available to local groups and interested people to just sit down in their house or a community facility or wherever and just take on board their questions and queries and their, and their issues and, and their suggestions and obviously make a record and note of that. So there's various ways and means that you can do it and you might want to do all of that. So this is something that's been a topic of discussion mm. in the Design Basso meetings yeah. and I think um, you know, it's quite clear that people want there to be um, something on our website that describes the process, that there are opportunities for people to engage, um, to give feedback, but also to be informed about the process and um, even potentially some pre-consultation work so that we know what it is that people want. But I don't feel like we actually have a plan for what we're going to do yet. Um, is, is this something that you're working on or how are we going to come up with this plan? Well, I haven't specifically worked on a, if you call it like a communications plan. Um, and again, that's probably in a bit of a limbo because we've also got this position looking for a, a, um, some sort of marketing or communications officer. I don't know what that role would entail, whether they would be working with ourselves uh, in this or how we might do it. Um, as I said, there's a whole range of ideas that you could do, but obviously at this stage I haven't certainly given any structure to how that may occur. Okay. Um. We're not supposed to be giving opinions, but I think it's really important. I think the message is coming through that we need to make this a priority. One of the questions that um, I'd asked the CEO was around the money in your budget and how much money we had there for consultation. Um, has that is that something that you've been able to look at and oh, discuss I had a, with him? I had an amount of about five thousand in the current budget, but that was more to do probably more with the um, statutory advertising and and um, I think it was essentially for that. Uh, and maybe some printed material, stuff like that. But at this stage, we're still working on our next budget and obviously um, I built in a little bit of uh, money to look at the statutory advertising also, but I've, I've highlighted to Mike that we may need to set aside some additional money if you want to have some forum types where you need professional facilitators to lead that. Um, otherwise, I can simply go out into the community, as I said before, I can sit there and present or inform them and, and outline to them what we're planning or what we're seeking uh, and sit down with them one on one. But if you're trying to elicit out of a group of people in a group situation, I think you do need a professional facilitator for that. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Brown? I agree with Sarah, there is some confusion here. There's, there's also some scepticism. Um, you had the glossy brochure of the Nashville Policing Plan before your time, it's now discredited and judged. But you've also got this problem with a minister responding to us just recently, saying that 
It's mainly that we have responsibility for the north of the railway line is not going to be considered for residential purposes. Yet the, the Todd diagrams that are still circulating in the community show that this big yellow patch on the northern side that takes in some of those places, that's where the scepticism and confusion comes mm. about. Have we written back, the question is, have we written back to the minister to say, look, you're not talk, your left hand's not talking your right hand because you've still got this material out there. About what you're going to do around Todd's, but you're saying that it's off the, off the, uh, it's not going to be considered. So. Yeah. Um, look, no, I haven't written back. Um, obviously, uh, when the, you know, the advice of the Minister was, so it sounds pretty certain that's the way we should go. Um, the only other way you could probably look at it in a different way is, and I'm a, a big fan of what you called um, uh, live work um, development, which in my view could go in an industrial area like that, particularly if it's changing or transforming. Um, and, and you're right, it, it is, it, you've had a planning document that's been agreed to, it shows it as a, an activity centre. What the Commission will argue, well, activity centres aren't just for high density, they're also places of employment. And obviously being an industrial area, that is a place of employment. Um, but originally they had a, you know, a periphery of uh, residential around it, so that's gone from the final version. Um, so but obviously the Minister seems to have made the decision, well, even though that Perth Pill might show the activity centre extending on the north side, obviously any future housing development's got to be restricted to the south side of Guildford Road. So uh, unless we get... The attendant community disruption. The team needs to be engaged at the time to get this other material yeah. uh, away from us and yeah. deal with what she's talking yeah. about. Because yeah. people need some certainty yeah. on the south side of that railway. So, Councillor mm -hmm. Brown, that might be something that you want to write into a proposed amendment for the council? Yeah. It's, it's, I need to flag it. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? Okay, 6-7, this is the Design Bassendine Advisory Group meeting. Madam Mayor, just in the <coughs> officer recommendation, it should actually say it points. Oh, yeah. Um, the presiding member? item. Anybody else? Nope. 6.8, your MOVE program that we had the presentation on earlier. Councillor Hamilton? I'm, um, <coughs> is it possible for the officers to give us um, a rundown of what they think our contribution should be, you know, because it was a, I'm, I, the presentation was great. I am interested in the program, but I'm just a little bit confused about <laughs> what and where the contributions are supposed to be. So the, the contribution is largely in kind. It's going to be um, support by the administration for the project to proceed um, and, and assistance with administration, um, rooms for meetings, those sorts of things. Cold hard cash, there's no absolute no requirement of the town to contribute anything. Um, however, you'd note the recommendation is for there to be a workshop with the councillors and the Department of Transport team on the 14th of August and that that would be the time when we would work up a program of activities um, that would be the Your Move um, Bassendine program. They'll come with some ideas of what they would like to um, undertake and that we can have you <coughs> at that time. That's probably the time that we would then make some determination as to whether or not a contribution by the town to the projects specifically that we would like to see undertaken might be appropriate. So and whether that's a, you know, a shared funding arrangement or we make a contribution, um, they're certainly not looking at the town making a substantial contribution. Okay, so how does that work with our budgeting process then? Are you making a recommendation for a budget inclusion for this item? Mm. No, we would be talking budget variation or something to be considered as part of the budget review for February 2019. No further questions? 6-9. Uh, Can I just ask 6-9? The bell tower at 20 Hamilton 
<laughs> Street, Bassendine. Um, I did have a resident approach me who's a bit upset about that. So, what's the um, has there been communication with residents in that street about this or not? Uh, unfortunately, the officer <laughs> who, who would have answered that is not here at the moment. So I'll, I'll get him to give you a call tomorrow if you like. Okay. We, we actually asked Brian if he would change the room tonight, and he said if there are any questions in my area, please take the councillors that they've taken on notice and answer. Them. Okay. <laughs> so Thank you. Sorry. Okay, so six ten. Yeah. I had a couple of questions, but I'm assuming them that fall into the same category. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Wilson. Uh, yeah, the proposed uh, seven lot development was knocked back. Um, is there someone here who's able to do a bit of a briefing on the? I'll get Brian to give you a call tomorrow. <laughs> okay, and we can ask it at can the council meeting as well next week. With these, sorry, with these questions for Brian, I don't suppose it can be circulated to all the councillors because sure. you know okay. I'm interested as well. But yeah, I, okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, I'm not sure why there is no motions listed on this agenda but um, item eight moving on to confidential business so we've got to consider the workforce plan which was item 6.3 and the bus stop shelter which is item 8.1 we'll need to turn off the streaming and thank you for being here this evening mr k thank you your worship